Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show on the brand new home office set. Ah, I forgot the background. Fixed it. But yeah, I, I got a home set built because uh, while I was sick, I really enjoyed actually being home, seeing the sun during the day. And with this, it's also going to make it easier for me to put out the, the 20 plus minute shows that you've been loving, I've been enjoying. Also, I think I'm going to reopen the P.O. Box so you guys can give me stuff to put up there that I can swap in and out. It should only take me a day to set up, but it'll probably take me a week. With that said, buckle up, hit that like button to give the new set some love, and let's just jump into it. Y'all, first up today, we had Dave Chappelle back in the news, actually for a number of reasons, starting with, of course, earlier this month, he was attacked while performing at the Hollywood Bowl by Isaiah Lee, with Lee rushing the stage, tackling Chappelle, reportedly he had a replica gun with an ejectable knife on him. He was then arrested, initial reports saying that he would face felony charges, but he ended up just getting four misdemeanor charges. And for the longest time, an official motive remained unclear, but now, we we have Lee who spoke to the New York Post over the weekend saying it was because he was triggered by Chappelle's jokes about the LGBTQ plus community and homelessness. With the report also saying that Lee said he reached his breaking point as another comedian in the show's lineup had made jokes about pedophilia, bringing back memories of being molested as a teenager. Also claiming that he didn't actually want to hurt Chappelle and adding, I wanted him to know that next time he should consider first running his material by people it could affect. I get this. Not the end of the road for Lee because Lee has now been charged with attempted murder for another incident that happened in December. With the LA County District Attorney's Office saying he is accused of stabbing a roommate during a fight at a transitional home. And it appears that Lee double fucked himself by attacking Chappelle because reportedly the victim identified Lee because of the media attention from the Chappelle incident. Though, like with the Chappelle related charges, Lee is pleading not guilty to this charge and is currently in jail. But that is also not the end of the Chappelle related news because both he and John Mulaney are facing backlash after Chappelle made a surprise appearance during Mulaney's show in Ohio. And while there are no videos of the set as attendees had to lock their phones away. Numerous reports and accounts from people there say that Chappelle made transphobic and homophobic jokes. With some of those people tweeting things like, y'all ever hear 12,000 people laugh at a transphobic joke while you're a trans person in the audience who didn't know the transphobic comedian would make a surprise appearance at the John Mulaney show? Yeah, wasn't fun. Another sharing the same experience and adding, the fact that there were so many young queer people like me in the audience too makes me so sad. We shouldn't have had to listen to jokes making fun of who we are. And as far as the in-person reactions, on top of people saying there were a ton of laughs, some did say there was some booing as well. And right now, if you're looking at the backlash, you know, it seems pretty evenly split between Chappelle and Mulaney, though the, the Mulaney stuff is new because many see this as him co-signing what Chappelle has said. But with all that said, I'd love to know your thoughts, whether it be about Isaiah Lee or specifically what's happening with Mulaney and Chappelle right now. And then, uh, unless you have an electric car and or you are a shut-in, by now you are probably aware of the nationwide nightmare that is gas prices. Just over the last few weeks, we've seen prices continuing to hit record highs. Just last week, costs reportedly surged to above $4 in all 50 states for the first time ever. Now, this week, price of gas is averaging over $4.59 per gallon nationwide, which is 50% higher than it was this time last year. And in addition to consumers hurting at the pump, there are also rising concerns for industries that rely on fuel and oil. Trucking, freight, airlines, plastic manufacturers, which respond by ramping up prices further down the supply chain to account for costs, then putting even more of a burden on consumers to pay for everyday items. And while yes, these spikes are partially being driven by surging oil prices prompted by Russia's ongoing war in Ukraine, that is not in any way the full picture. In fact, some have even argued that what's going on with Russia is being used as a smokescreen to veil what is really happening. Which is why today, I want to focus on an aspect of this whole situation that's not really being discussed as much as it should be in conversations about gas prices. The role that oil companies play. In recent weeks, several of the largest oil companies in the world have released their profits for the first quarter of this year, which of course has been dominated by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And while yes, many global sectors are reeling from the economic toll of this war, the oil industry? The oil industry is literally posting record profits from sky-high gas prices. In the first quarter, ExxonMobil more than doubled its earnings from the same period last year reporting a net profit of 5.5 billion. Meanwhile, Chevron logged its best quarterly earnings in almost a decade and Shell literally had its highest earnings ever. In fact, according to a new analysis conducted by the Center for American Progress into the top five oil companies, which includes the three I just mentioned, just in the first three months of 2022, those corporations brought in more than 300% more in profits than in the first quarter of 2021. That is a total of more than $35 billion in profits in just three months. And understand, this is not just like the numbers look kind of good because you're comparing them to pandemic numbers, or at least four of those those five companies, that's a massive increase in profits from even before the pandemic. Now, there is good news with this story if you're an investor in an oil company. Ha, you thought I was gonna go positive. Nope, this is the PDS. We're seeing oversized earnings leading to big dividends and share buybacks, which is why with all of this, there's been a lot of backlash against oil companies and their investors for profiting off the struggles of everyday Americans. This including from top lawmakers in Congress like Representative Katie Porter, who accused oil companies of driving their record profits by using their market power to unfairly increase prices while speaking on the House floor last week. The oil and gas industry currently has more than nine thousand permits to drill for oil on federal land, but they are deliberately keeping production low to please their investors and increase their short-term profits. Even when the price of crude oil falls, 
oil and gas companies have refused to pass those savings on to consumers. Let me be clear, price gouging is anti-capitalist. It exploits a lack of competition, which is a hallmark of capitalism. It is an effort to juice corporate profits at the expense of customers. Energy markets are reeling because of Russia's, in Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Big oil companies, however, are using this temporary chaos to cover up their abuse. Now, taking aim at big oil and pointing out bullshit, this is not something new for Porter. For example, you might have seen just six months ago, she went viral for grilling oil executives over flimsy commitments to clean energy and drilling permits on public lands and using M&Ms and bags of rice to illustrate her points. But especially now with these latest quarterly profit reports, the representative is seriously ramping up her efforts to crack down on these corporations. With her earlier this month introducing legislation aimed at reducing gas prices, and this bill called the Consumer Fuel Price Gouging Prevention Act would give President Biden the authority to issue an energy emergency declaration that would be effective for up to 30 days, but with the possibility of being renewed. During the emergency period, it would be illegal for anyone to increase gas or home energy fuel prices to a level that is exploitive or, quote, unconscionably excessive. Beyond that, the proposal would also give the Federal Trade Commission the power to investigate and manage instances of price gouging from larger companies and give state authorities the ability to enforce price gouging violations in civil courts. And very notably here, just last week, the House actually passed the legislation. But, of course, it also faces an uphill battle with the 50-50 split in the Senate, which is also often not a 50-50 split because of Joe Manchin. And then, of course, on top of that, this has already been widely opposed by Republicans and has faced a lot of lobbying from interest groups. And then, okay, let, let's talk about this. I have heard about this hanger thing, that it makes your head move. Fuck, ah. Uh. Oh no, 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 no. Is that real? On. Okay, does it matter which side it's going? No. <laughs> ah! No! They call that the hanger reflex. If you haven't seen it already, it's blowing up on TikTok. If you haven't done it already, I'm sure you're gonna run to a, a closet. Don't stay in there though. We love you for who you are. And maybe you, like I did, I, I watched this. I was like, that's stupid. That's not a real thing. My head just involuntarily turned. There were puppet master strings. I don't like anything that reminds me I'm just a dumb bag of meat. But what just happened to me and now a countless others is something called the hanger effect. And the thing is, this isn't some new thing. It turns out this was something that was first reported back in 1991 and there was even a 2015 study with 95.8% of the people in that study turning their head. And as far as why this is blowing up now, it appears that it's because, or at least in part, because of a tweet from David Shopik. He's a researcher at NYU that studies balance. And as far as the reason it happens, right, why do you involuntarily turn your head? No one knows. It's just a thing that happens. But it turns out, in addition to just like blowing my mind, this is actually beneficial. In the study, they developed this thing that's kind of a hat, right? Instead of the hanger, it would just apply pressure. They called it an HR device. And according to I fucking love science, scientists have also researched other applications of the HR device, including a treatment for cervical dystonia, which is when patients have an involuntary neck contraction that can cause the head to twist or turn to one side. And adding, while there are a variety of treatments for this, including spinal cord and electrical stimulation, some of the treatments can be invasive and costly. And what they found was that when the device was applied to CD patients for 30 minutes a day for three months, ultimately it improved atypical rotation in patients. And going on to write, another paper described a woman who had her head turned to the right for five years. When she wore the HR device on her head, she could turn her head easily to the left. Three months later, her head movement problems had almost completely resolved even without wearing the device and she saw no reoccurrence after nine months. So yeah, my main takeaway is this is just further confirmation that we are just dumb bags of meat and nerves. All right, you sure you want to try this? See? Look. <laughs> I don't believe you. This hanger thing is not true. It just puts force on your hand. I hand to hand on your life am not faking it. You are faking. But from that, I want to take a second to thank a fantastic sponsor of today's show, Keeps. Did you know that two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time that they're 35? Maybe you have that friend or that family member that's dealing with hair loss that's on your mind. And here's the thing, you don't have to just sit around and wait for that to happen to you. Whether you're looking to prevent hair loss, stimulate hair growth, or just take better care of the hair that you have, Keeps has you covered. Keeps helps you stop hair loss before it's too late with a scientific and affordable approach to treatments that are up to 90% effective at reducing and stopping further hair loss. And in addition to clinically proven treatments, Keeps has an award-winning 
Thickening All Natural Thickening Shampoo and Conditioner System. And you can get these products delivered directly to your door. That means no more going in person to the doctor's office for prescription, saving you both valuable time and money. So if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash Franco or just click the link in the description down below to receive 50% off your first order. And then we need to talk about the continued insanity with this baby formula shortage, the steps we're seeing to try and combat it. Among the things we're seeing, you had President Biden on Saturday signing into law, a measure that will allow more formula to be purchased using funds from a federal program that helps low-income women and children. You've got the Secretary of Defense approving U.S. military aircraft to transport baby formula, with the Biden administration tweeting out videos showing the transportation and saying, Operation Fly Formula is underway. Thanks to the teamwork of the men and women of the U.S. Transportation Command, needed specialty infant formula is in the United States. And noting that the first flight was loaded up with more than 70,000 pounds of infant formula, with the White House saying the baby formula was made in Europe, but produced by Nestle and made in an FDA-approved facility. Which is an important thing to note, because with the baby formula shortage, there's been a lot of confusion. With more and more American mothers going, okay, I understand there's a shortage in the United States, but why can't I just get some formula from Europe? And that just one of numerous questions that many mothers and many families have right now. Which is why I reached out to Dr. Amna Hussein. She's a board-certified pediatrician, board-certified lactation consultant, and owner of Pure Direct Pediatrics in New Jersey. So I guess the first thing I, I wanted to ask was, what what is the deal with, with European formula? I, I think a lot of people like myself weren't even aware until the last week or so that it's actually illegal to import and sell European formula, but is, is there something wrong with it or is there some, some sort of reason? Yeah, actually, it's not necessarily illegal and we wish it okay. was, but it's not illegal. And that's what makes it tricky because um, you have parents who are actually getting formula from these third party retailers and you're really not aware of the distribution pri uh, practices, the importation process, how long these formula are left on trucks or shipping supplies. Obviously, you don't want it to sit out in the hot heat right now. It's like 90 something degrees. It's going to increase higher and higher if you're sitting in like a storage facility. So it's just there's too many unknowns, too much that's not really regulated and for me as a pediatrician to feel comfortable recommending these formulas. We don't live in Europe. So that's one thing I tell parents too, is that if there's a recall by the EU, how are you staying up to pace on that? I'm not as your pediatrician, and I'm sure many parents aren't either with so much to worry about. So it's really not the safest route, not to mention labeling practices are very different in Europe as well. So hypoallergenic here means something very different than hypoallergenic labels on formulas in Europe. For the most part, it sounds like unknown variables. Is that also part of the reason we've been seeing more pediatricians saying, you know, really worry about the sourcing. A lot of people have been sharing and people are, there have been stories about people making their own at home and then passing right. it off. And is that part of the reason? That's a huge part of the reason. Um, so when it comes to formula, I know that people, it's called all types of different nicknames, science milk or, you know, factory milk, all types of different things that this is not the appropriate thing that's not safe for babies. It doesn't matter anyway. Formula is not good for you. But this is actually not true at all. It's a very highly regulated substance by the FDA, really highly extensively studied the safest nutrition that we can give to our babies second to breast milk. And when it comes to what we're putting in our baby's bodies, that's why pediatricians are so hypervigilant about what you're feeding your baby. So you're right. So when it comes to sourcing, if you're grabbing formula from a friend or something like that, well, you have to make sure that if the can's already been open, it has to be consumed within 30 days. Now we talk about can, but there's also differences in how long formula can stay good for if it's a shelf stable. So if it's um, already filtered, or if it's ready to feed, for example, if it's a concentrated type of formula, or if it's pre-mixed, all of these things, there's rules about it. And there's also rules about once your baby's lips have touched that formula bottle, when it has to be discarded. So we do have mm -hmm. to actually, you know, really be cognizant of those rules because we don't want to increase the risk of infection and bacterial contamination and worsen a problem that unfortunately we're already in a very difficult place with the formula shortage. Regarding breastfeeding, what would your response be as a pediatrician to the, the people that that have responded to this news and this story uh, as, as just saying, why don't moms breastfeed? Mm, yeah, and, and Philip, I'm actually a lactation consultant as well, so I can answer this twofold. Perfect. Um, it's not that simple. It's really not that simple. And any parent who has breastfed or supported another parent through breastfeeding, it's not simple. There are two parties involved in breastfeeding, and sometimes it's issues with the mom or the parents, uh, the lactating parent side, and sometimes it's an issue for the breastfed baby or the baby who's trying to latch. 
You also need to have a very strong support system when you're breastfeeding, right? Somebody to help you with getting snacks, making sure that you're well fed, because here you are tied down to the baby. Um, you are obviously going through a difficult time and you want to make sure you have an adequate support system there. And it's a luxury, unfortunately, in this country, we have to say that not all parents have the same access to a good support system. And many parents, again, may not be able to breastfeed it for a number of reasons. You could be a mastectomy survivor. You could have issues with supply. You could have preemie babies. So you don't have enough supply there or they weren't able to latch very early. So it would be great if you're able to breastfeed and you have enough supply to breastfeed your baby. But not every parent and majority of all parents don't have that luxury. And I say this as not only a pediatrician, but a lactation consultant as well, that it is very tough and it's not very simple to do. Would you say that right now the, the biggest concern with the formula is for under six months? Because I've seen that it seems like there are more temporary solutions for above six months? Yeah, I would say as a pediatrician, my worry is the kids under six months of age, particularly four to six months of age, and the children who have allergies, well-proven established allergies. So some parents, you sometimes find that they switch around formulas because they perceive that their child may have intolerances or allergies. But we're talking about like a proven dairy allergy, for example. So then you're looking at a formula that um, like Nutramagen or Alimentum, some of these might sound very familiar to some parents for babies who have a dairy allergy. Well, now that Alimentum is off, you know, really the, the shelves due to the Abbott factories closing down and having that shortage, more parents are going for Nutramagen. And Nutramagen now is becoming very difficult to find. So those are the parents that I really worry for, where they already have dairy intolerance. The babies have dairy intolerances and dairy allergies, I should actually say, not an intolerance. And they really can't find all those solutions that we've been able to provide for them because their baby has a proven allergy. That becomes really difficult. For, for parents right now, I know that I've seen a lot frustrated as far as the, you know, don't make your own at home, don't dilute. A lot of people saying, you know, what am I supposed to do? Um, and. Yeah. You know, on the show, we've talked about contact your pediatrician. They may have samples, but are there other ways that people can get formula when it seems like there's really none on the shelves? Right. So there are a few options. And I will say like, yes, pediatrician is great because they have samples, but a lot of us don't have our samples anymore. And the samples stopped coming because we are in this situation to begin with. So I would say check smaller stores and small drug stores as well. Those mom and pop pharmacies, medical arts pharmacies, some of them do sell formula and they may not be out of supply when the bigger stores are. If you can afford it, you can buy formula online when until the shortages ease. But again, I'm seeing that even online, it's becoming more and more difficult. I've heard some parents online say that, oh, just switch uh, shipping to uh, or switch to Canada, I think, from the U.S. And then that begins to create shipping supplies and shortages in other regions, which I don't necessarily agree with. Um, and so I'm not a big fan of that. You can also obviously check social media groups. Um, there are families who are, you know, no longer in need of certain formulas or formula cans or child's outgrown it, or maybe they don't need it anymore and it's unopened. That's an option as well. Um, those would be the bigger places that I would try. I would say the biggest places I would try, obviously your WIC offices, they do have to have a certain amount of formula. And I will say that if you are a pregnant parent right now and you're seeing this and you're worrying, you're like, what kind of 2022 bingo card did I pick up? Um, just do know that in hospitals and in birthing centers, we do have formula samples and those we critically keep those at a certain supply because parents should have some to go home with their baby because there is a period of time, even if you choose to breastfeed, that your milk may not be in yet. And we want to make sure that there's enough nutrition with those for those parents when they're at home with baby. And doctor, is there anything else you want to hit on that, that people should know about or that you want to speak on regarding this issue? Sure. So I think a lot of parents are worried about um, the diluting part and why is that not a good idea? Well, when you dilute something, you end up increasing the risk of not only nutritional imbalances, but electrolyte deficiencies as well. So this is meant to be made the way it's meant to be made. And I would reason we say go to your pediatrician, and I know that parents get very frustrated by that. I see a lot of comments that we want to see more tangible advice. And the reason we say that is not every baby is the same. My advice, as I've mentioned here on this show, is going to be different for zero to six months babies. It's going to be very different for babies who have certain allergies. If you have a medical history, there's the issue of access to resources. 
all of these items play a huge role. So that's why one advice isn't the same as what it's going to be for everybody else. Um, it's very tailored to the baby. I know this is a very difficult time. Try to take the advice that we provide. We have provided some other um, options as well. You could potentially try cow's milk for a very short period of time if your baby's over six months of age. I think it's really important to mention, Philip, that that is just for a short period of time until the shortage eases. I don't want parents to walk away from that statement thinking cow's milk is great for a baby over six months of age. You do run the risk of iron deficiency in that standpoint. Toddler formula might be an option. Those babies that I mentioned who have dairy allergies, I have recommended toddler Nutramagen because here I am in a pinch. Um, it's usually not something I recommend, toddler formulas, but this is an option if you are in a pinch and your baby's over six months of age. So a big thank you to Dr. Amna Hussein for giving us her time today. Hopefully that was helpful for you or you know someone that it can be helpful for. Just know that it's trying times for a lot of people, a lot of confusion, and so if, if I get the chance, I want to try to have experts on. But from that, I want to take a second to thank a fantastic sponsor of today's show, NordVPN, or more directly, NordVPN.com slash Phil. Y'all know, I've been a Nord customer for years, and I'm here to remind you, it's important to be protected, and NordVPN's advanced threat protection feature is the next step in your digital security. Threat protection neutralizes cyber threats before they can do any real damage to your device, makes your browsing safer, smoother, and helps identify malware-ridden files, stops you from landing on malicious websites, and blocks trackers and intrusive ads on the spot. I get this, once you enable the threat protection feature in your NordVPN app settings, it protects your browsing even when you're not connected to a VPN server. And it also helps websites load faster because it blocks the junk. It's a great benefit that more people need to know about. Once again, I think it's the biggest bonus feature. It's working even when you're not connected to a VPN. So take advantage of an exclusive deal and head on over to nordvpn.com slash phil to get a two-year plan at a huge discount plus one additional month for free. And then in huge domestic and international news, we should talk about President Biden today making waves because during a press conference in Tokyo, this happened. You didn't want to get involved in the Ukraine conflict militarily for obvious reasons. Are you willing to get involved militarily to defend Taiwan if it comes to that? Yes. You are? That's a commitment we made. That's a commitment we made. We are not, look, here's the situation. We agree with a one China policy. We signed on to it and all the attendant agreements made from there. But the idea that, that it could be taken by force just taken by force is just not is just not appropriate. It will dislocate the entire region, and be another action similar to what happened in in uh, in Ukraine. So yeah, the the TLDR for that is if you attack Taiwan, we will start World War III. And understandably, that set off seismic shifts in the foreign policy community because Biden's remarks here they appear to mark a shift away from the stance the U.S. has held toward China for decades, which is known as strategic ambiguity. Where basically we're like, I don't know, maybe we'll defend Taiwan. Maybe we won't though. But we could. But we might not. With the hope being that by being ambiguous, that would deter China because they might not want to fuck around and find out. Or don't even give China the ability to call a bluff. But in this press conference, Biden appearing to just throw that completely out the window. Even warning that Beijing was already, quote, flirting with danger right now by flying so close and all the maneuvers undertaken. With that referring to a growing number of Chinese sorties, naval exercises, and other power projection in the Taiwan Straits. Though, as you heard in the video, he did not reverse the one China policy, which is the official recognition of there being only one China with its capital in Beijing. Right? Because Taiwan actually considers itself the real Chinese nation. Its official name is the Republic of China. And that, because after Mao Zedong's communist movement took over the mainland after World War II, Chinese nationalists fled to Taiwan and set up a new government there. So today, Beijing considers Taiwan to just be a breakaway province, which is why many fear it will invade just like Russia did in Ukraine. You know, with this news, you have some welcoming Biden's more aggressive posture, like government professor Matthew Kronig tweeting, strategic ambiguity is over, strategic clarity is here. This is the third time Biden has said this, good. China should welcome this. Washington is helping Beijing to not miscalculate. But that said, there is still some confusion here. But as Kronig pointed out, this isn't the first time that Biden has said this. Right, like late last year, Anderson Cooper asked whether the US would defend Taiwan from a Chinese attack and Biden Biden said yes, with the White House then immediately clarifying that there would be no change in its policy. And just like then, now you have the White House again walking back Biden's comments. Which is why you have historian Stephen Wertheim tweeting, it is truly dangerous for the president to keep misstating US policy toward Taiwan. How many more times will this happen? The West's robust response to Russian aggression in Ukraine could serve to deter China from invading Taiwan, but Biden's statement risks undoing the potential benefit and instead helping to bring about a Taiwan conflict. Self-injurious and entirely unforced. Also, in addition to the controversy around Taiwan, Biden also unveiled a new Indo-Pacific trade agreement signed by the U.S. and 12 Asian nations. With that, connected and notable because many see it as another move to cut China out of regional trade packs and supply chains. But to be clear, besides the rhetoric, none of this represents too dramatic
dramatic of a shift from past U.S. policy toward China. Right, we've already seen American warships prowling through the Taiwan Strait, with the Pentagon sending weapons to Taiwan and secretly training officers there. Though, if I'm talking about it, not really secret. But still, understandably, you have some comparing Biden's remarks now to another comment back in March where he said Putin cannot remain in power. So right now, we just have to kind of wonder, are these just gaps, or is this actually the policy behind the public statement? But I guess, ultimately, time will tell, but hopefully it won't tell in a way where everyone dies. But ultimately, that is where that story and today's show ends. As always, thank you for watching, like, and being a part of the conversation down below. If you're looking for more to watch right now, I got you covered here or here. I'm always bad with the directions. But of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love your faces, and I'll see you tomorrow.